Coming up on the FSR Sark Fighter podcast, a bonus episode, an FSR town hall on transitioning off steroids into new and investigational treatments. Uh, sarcoidosis patients deserve something better than just something off-label. Listen in as I talk with the CEO of Atire Pharma, the CEO of FSR, a patient, and a physician as we look at the trouble with prednisone over long periods of time and the strong possibility that a new drug will be approved in the next few years to replace it in many cases. Uh, The sarcoidosis community, as we all know, has been misunderstood and poorly understood for far too long. Updates to our collective knowledge of sarcoidosis are long overdue. Uh, And the best way that I see this happening is through increased dialogue and awareness on all levels. An FSR Town Hall, coming up on the FSR Sark Fighter Podcast. This is the Sark Fighter Podcast, living with sarcoidosis and other rare diseases. Here's your host, John Carlin. Hello and welcome. This is episode 85 of the FSR Sark Fighter podcast. This episode is brought to you by ATAR Pharmaceuticals. To learn more about their new pulmonary sarcoidosis trial, EFSOFIT, visit www.stopsarcoidosis.org slash ATAR trial. And FSR is grateful to ATAR Pharma for their sponsorship of Awareness Month, which is this month, April of 2023. And today on the podcast, we'll be talking more about FSR. I'll be talking with SARC patient Jim Kuhn, also Dr. Shambu Ariel, the medical director at Innova Sarcoidosis Center, and one of the very first centers to sign up to be part of the Global Alliance for FSR. And we'll be speaking with Mary McGowan, the CEO of FSR, and Sanjay Shukla, the president and CEO of ATIRE. Now, this is a FSR town hall that I hosted on March 25th of 2023. This was an engaging look at how patients feel about being on steroids to fight the inflammation from sarcoidosis and also how doctors feel about having very few options other than steroids. And when I say steroids, what we're talking about is prednisone. We'll also look at how FSR is helping researchers find some new answers, and then how ATIRE is ever so close to having the first ever sarcoidosis-specific drug called efsofitamod now in stage 3 clinical trials. And that is the furthest that any drug has ever been with respect to being a sarcoidosis-specific drug, and they are still recruiting patients to participate in that clinical trial. If you're listening, especially after you listen to the town hall, I'm hoping that you'll want to consider joining this important trial if uh, you are one of the people that meet the criteria to be able to participate. So listen, listen to this for yourself and see if this is something that you would like to do. But I got to tell you, once again, um, thank you to FSR for putting together all the top people from all the top places, and and patient Jim Kuhn, who works as a volunteer with FSR, he is a patient navigator, he's a patient advocate, and so he's reaching out and talking to SARC patients all the time, and he himself has sarcoidosis. So when you when you get all these people there together, and we're we're all on this call, and everybody is there to answer all the relevant questions. And, and these are the people who are dealing with it every day. It just really gives you an opportunity for the next few minutes to sit down and listen and, and hear what's going on with this ATAR clinical trial. And it's very, very promising. So that's coming up uh, just just here in just a couple of minutes. But I do want to remind you that April is Sarcoidosis Awareness Month, and we are all following this year's mantra in 2023, stand up 
for SARC. And there are all kinds of things that you can do to participate. We talked about it in the previous episode, but there is a link in the show notes, stopsarcoidosis.org slash standupforsark, all one word, stand up for SARC. And there is, I just checked out the website just before recording this, and there's a really cool gallery of photos that people have already sent in, holding signs, posing like Superman or whatever superhero you can think of, wearing their sarcoidosis attire, basically some fancy versions of people of purple t-shirts, and there's just a really fun gallery of pictures right there. So check that out at, at uh, sarcoidosis.org slash standupforsark. And I want to remind you, the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research is proud to host its inaugural Sarcoidosis Crystal Awards Gala, celebrating connections, collaboration, and catalyzing research. It'll be on May 24th in Washington, D.C., and it brings together everybody in the sarcoidosis community. There will be an evening where we celebrate clinicians, researchers, and advocates from around the globe, all leading the charge to advance SARC research and carve the path towards better treatments and a cure, exactly what we're talking about here today in this uh, episode of the podcast with the town hall. But uh, you may be aware that at the gala, FSR will be handing out four awards, and I want to tell you about the honorees just Real quickly, uh, the Sarcoidosis Crystal Award for Excellence in Research and Clinical Care goes to Marjolene Drent, MD and PhD, and FSR Scientific Advisory Board member, Professor Emeritus ILD at the Faculty for Health and Medicine and Life Sciences at Maastricht University in the Netherlands, and also a guest senior researcher ILD, Center of Excellence at St. Antonius Hospital in Neuwegen. I hope I'm saying that right in the Netherlands. Uh, And then also uh, FSR Crystal Community Engagement Award goes to George A. Mensa, MD, FACC, the director for the Center for Transplantation Research and Implementation Science at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, which is part of the National Institutes of Health. And then an actress that you likely have seen on your screen at one point or another, the Sarcoidosis Crystal Spotlight Award, goes to Gerald Prescott Galian. You may have seen her in The Walking Dead as Jackie, or in The Swamp Thing in the DC Universe as Madame Xanadu. She has been on Netflix's Resort to Love, playing the role of Naomi King, and most recently, All the Queen's Men. She played the role of Judge Martha. And so that's Gerald Prescott Galian. So she is receiving a Crystal Award. And I'm pleased to tell you that I will be receiving a Crystal Award because of this very podcast. And I I was flabbergasted and surprised and so pleased that this project is being seen as being so helpful to the cause of fighting sarcoidosis. So all of this is coming up at the Crystal Awards Gala, and I'd love to meet you in person, talk to you, hear more about your situation. Um, Maybe uh, you can come up and pull me aside and say, hey, I'd like to be on the podcast. I've got this sarcoidosis story I'd like to share with people, and we can make arrangements for that. But it's all coming up in Washington on May 24th, and there is a link in the show notes. I hope to see you there. In the meantime, stand by. The town hall is coming up next. I feel like a zombie Just feeding at stumbling Hi, I hope you're enjoying the Sark Fighter Podcast. You may be wondering, what can I do to help? How can I be a part of the sarcoidosis solution? It's simple. Make a donation to KISS. Kick in to stop sarcoidosis. 100% of the money goes to the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research. Look for a link in the show notes of the Sark Fighter Podcast. So welcome today to our webinar. Uh, We are very pleased to have you all here with us. Uh, A couple of bits of housekeeping for everyone. If you have any questions during today's webinar, please type them into the Q&A. The chat has been disabled, but you may receive some links from us in the chat. 
um, throughout the webinar. We're now pleased to turn this over to John Carlin, host of the FSR Sarcoidosis Sark Fighter podcast. Welcome, John. Well, thank you, and uh, and good morning, everyone. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity for all of us to learn more about uh, potentially new and better treatments for sarcoidosis. So this is officially the foundation for sarcoidosis researches. Uh, this is a town hall discussion, uh, transitioning off steroids and into new and investigational therapies. And again, I'm John Carlin. I'm the host of the FSR Sark Fighter podcast and the co-chair of the Patient Advisory Committee. And I have the honor of guiding this uh, very important discussion around the experiences uh, that folks have transitioning from or reducing steroid treatment uh, and onto new and investigational therapies. And we are just so honored today to see so many friends, family, clinicians, and staff with us. So thank you again for joining us for this important event, because this is really groundbreaking stuff that we are working on here today. This is, these are, this is an area that has uh, never before in the history of sarcoidosis treatment been explored at this level. So before we get started, I do want to just share a little bit of quick housekeeping for everyone here. Uh, there will be no time for Q&A today. Uh, however, if you do have questions for the staff, please put them uh, in the chat or or reach out to FSR and the team will get back to you with the support. And a link to today's conversation will be shared with all the registered attendees uh, and that'll be made available on the FSR YouTube channel. Now, the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research officially would like to thank ATAR Pharma for providing the generous support to make this event possible today. And we'll be hearing more from their CEO here in just a moment. In fact, let me get to the introductions for today. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce a good friend of mine, Jim Kuhn, patient advocate and patient navigator for the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research and a fellow SARC fighter. Jim does so much heavy lifting on behalf of the disease and, and you'll be hearing from Jim here shortly. So Jim, welcome. Mary McGowan is the Chief Executive Officer for the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research. And Mary, thank you for all you are doing uh, on behalf of patients and the entire world that is uh, sarcoidosis right now. Uh, Dr. Shambu Ariel is the Medical Director for Innova Lung Transplant Program and the Innova Sarcoidosis Center. And I would be remiss if I didn't point out that Innova is a founding member of the FSR Global Sarcoidosis Alliance. So Dr. Ariel, thank you for joining us. And of course, Dr. Shukla, CEO and president of Atire Pharma, uh, working on a therapy that potentially could reduce the need uh, for steroids in our treatment. When we say steroids, for the most part, we're talking about prednisone. So at this point, I want to turn it over to Mary for some welcoming statements and sort of an overall look at more of what we're doing today. Mary McGowan, our CEO. Thank you, John. We are so pleased to have you moderate the discussion today and welcome to our esteemed panelists and to all the attendees to this important discussion on transitioning off steroids and onto new and investigational therapies. Thank you all for being here today to participate and to learn from our panelists. I would like to again extend a special thank you to ATIRE Pharma for sponsoring this timely discussion. So today's event was shaped uh, in direct response to our sarcoidosis community. FSR recently surveyed the community about the challenges in transitioning to new therapies from steroids. Thank you to all who took the time to share your feedback and reflections. So 64% of survey respondents are currently taking steroids and 80% experienced unwanted side effects from the steroid treatment. 100% of respondents want to learn more about non-steroid based treatments. And I imagine that's why we have most of you who have joined us today on this webinar. Based on results of the survey, we believe today's discussion is an opportunity to ensure that patients who want to learn more will gain the information and insights they need to fully consider their interest and support for new and investigational therapies. And what I'm most excited about today 
is talking about how new therapies and development have the potential to bring forth sarcoidosis specific therapies that provide powerful alternatives to steroids. Today's discussion will focus on the process of transitioning from steroid treatment, how currently available clinical trials are shaping the future of the treatment landscape, and ways for us to improve the process of transition from steroids in the future. Again, thank you all for joining us today. And John, I'll turn it back to you. Great. Thank you, Mary. A hundred percent say they are interested in learning more about non-steroid based treatments. And I uh, have been down that road and people on the podcast have been down that road. And I'm not surprised that that number is a hundred percent. So thank you so much, Mary. Uh, there've been a lot of advancements in the past few years, all spearheaded by FSR in partnership with committed companies like ATIRE, who are uh, looking for uh, a better understanding at the molecular level, the mechanism of showing how sarcoidosis forms and impacts the body and in the development then of new potential sarcoidosis specific therapies. And I know today we'll, we'll be talking about all the therapies that are out there uh, that people are taking, none of them have been developed specifically for sarcoidosis. So, so to break through and have sarcoidosis-specific therapies and perhaps uh, one that would uh, eliminate the need for prednisone or steroids would be amazing. So steroids right now uh, are the definition of a double-edged sword. My, my fellow patients and I, we've had many conversations on the podcast about our love-hate relationship with how steroids and their side effects, yes, they work. They're the first line of defense, but the side effects are so bad I, you know, people have said over and over and over on the podcast, they don't know what's worse, the the uh, the side effects from the medicine uh, or the disease itself. So it's heartening to know that these new potential therapies are on the horizon and, and that this uh, could be a big breakthrough in fighting sarcoidosis. So now I want to hear from each of our panelists today to share a few words. And I want to start with uh, Dr. Sanjay Shukla, the president and CEO of ATIRE. Dr. Shukla. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, John. I'm thrilled to be here uh, to talk to you today on Saturday. I'm in San Diego, so happy to uh, uh, really uh, talk to a large audience. Uh, uh, thrilled to talk a little bit about the work we've done at ATIRE uh, and what we've been working on really for the past, I'd say, seven or eight years to try to get us a, a therapy um, for sarcoidosis patients, specifically something that can um, reduce or even spare uh, steroids from from uh, patients, because we know uh, that this is the frontline therapy. Uh, it struck me that you know this this survey talked about one hundred percent of the respondents who want to get off steroids, and it it, it occurred to me that um, years ago uh, when I started this journey, uh, a board member and even some folks on Wall Street said steroids are just fine for sarcoidosis patients, and that still sticks in my mind and bothers me because it was such a disconnect. To what I knew from my limited experience going back to medical school on how sarcoidosis patients felt um, and, and the realities of what steroids do to uh, their bodies. Uh, I've spent the last 20 to 25 years, frankly, battling steroids, uh, working in other conditions like lupus and myasthenia, where um, now there are better therapies, specific therapies that have alleviated and sometimes eliminated steroids from the treatment arsenal. So ATIRE has been really committed to sarcoidosis. I would say that we're uh, leading the way here um, uh, and thrilled to see that other companies have joined us. Um, we have a groundbreaking trial right now. Um, groundbreaking, why do I say that? Dr. Boffman uh, in Cincinnati pointed out to me that uh, we're the only trial that's reached phase three uh, ever. Uh, I think that in itself is a monumental achievement for us to move a therapy into phase three is something that's never been seen before. Uh, phase three is that last leg of the journey, but perhaps the most difficult. It requires a real commitment, uh, not only from a company like ATIRE, but also frankly, the patients. Um, in other areas, uh, the, uh, diseases where a specific therapy is targeted for that specific disease, that's the goal here. Uh, sarcoidosis patients deserve something better than just something off-label. So we're gonna talk about that today. So our trial, EPSOFIT, is currently enrolling 
in about 10 countries. Uh, we're targeting 80 hospitals around the world. Uh, Dr. Ariel is one of our centers up in uh, Fairfax um, and, and really happy to be starting that trial. We have an opportunity here to have the first therapy approved for sarcoidosis. And while we are targeting pulmonary sarcoidosis, we'll talk about ways where I think our therapy could benefit all sarcoidosis patients, but it's gonna come down to um, the clinical trial, the commitment of the patients. We're reliant on patients and the data they produce. Uh, we'll talk about that. Um, and I know it can be concerning participating in a clinical trial, but I'll say something that I said last month, I was with Mary in Miami. This data set, 260 patients that we're trying to enroll, if you're one of those 264 patients, you may be part of a data set that goes to the FDA, that gets a, approval, that can help tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of sarcoidosis patients. So when you talk about, I know we talk about SARC warriors here, this is another uh, call to arms. Um, and ATAR is committed to, to meet folks halfway. Um, this is a trial that I think is designed by listening to patients around how steroids need to be removed from uh, the toolkit. That's how I designed the trial many years ago, uh, side by side with the experts in the FSR. Um, so really um, excited that you know our, our, our drug can potentially be the first, and I'm hopeful that others follow because we're gonna need a, a broader toolkit here. Uh, all clinicians uh, know this, and no one company should um, claim that um, something is curative. We're, we're starting here. I think we can really uh, address some concerns um, and happy happy to be part of this roundtable. Great. Thank you, Dr. Shukla. Uh, Dr. Ariel, let's hear from you now. Thank you, John. You guys, you hear me okay? Perfect. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thanks, John, Mary, uh, Jim, and, and uh, Dr. Shukla. Thank you for the uh, FSR uh, team that's made this possible. Um, my name is Shambhu Ariel. I'm the medical director of the lung, uh, of the SARCOD program uh, here at Innova Fairfax Hospital in the outskirts of DC. But the other hat I wear is also I'm the medical director of the lung transplant program here. And uh, the, you know, uh, I, I wanted to mention that because as a lung transplant provider uh, physician, I end up seeing uh, many patients with end-stage sarcoid that end up having to go to transplant and transplant so hard. Um, you know, time after lung transplant is limited um, and, uh, you know, often, you know, uh, you're left with having to take a lot of medications um, and, and it's a totally different journey. Um, as uh, many of the other panelists pointed out, steroids are are the and, and many of you are, as you're living your life, um, steroids are the first line of defense. But they're fraught with a lot of complications, which I don't need to point out here. So I'm really excited that there is something new um, that's being developed, and I I'm very very excited to be a part of this journey, uh, along with um, you know all of you uh, as a researcher and as a provider. And, uh, you know, I, I really look forward to uh, enrolling patients in this trial and eventually finding something that will uh, help patients uh, get off steroids, uh, which um, I think is going to be a major paradigm shift in, in the last, uh, you know, in, in the history of sarcoidosis. And thanks again. Okay. Well, Dr. Errol, thank you so much uh, for joining us here today. And Jim, let's hear from you from the patient perspective. Thanks, John. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jim Kuhn. Unlike uh, my esteemed colleagues uh, that you've heard from, I am not a doctor. However, I do support quite a few on my healthcare team quite <laughs> generously. So it's uh, it's great to be part of the discussion today, representing our patient community. Uh, I also am quite excited by the trials and uh new developments that are finally happening in the sarcoidosis world. I am quite hopeful about what this might mean for my health and the health for all of the sarcoidosis patients uh, and how I might feel on a day-to-day -day basis. However, it also can be quite frightening uh, to move off of steroids uh, or other therapies that are working today, even though uh, they, as John mentioned, it is a double-edged sword. Moving off can 
cause concerns about flare-ups when you move off or other side effects or other problems that can happen when you change therapies. Personally, I've been on a merry-go-round of therapies trying to find something that would work for me and cover at least some of my symptoms, pain, fatigue, chronic cough. You patients who are on the call know the list I'm talking about. You all probably have uh, many of the same uh, symptoms on your list. I've been on and off steroids a bunch of times uh, over my years, and I've had serious flare-ups requiring trips to the ER, urgent care, or other specialists. I've taken a risk in trying all these other therapies that were meant for other people, not for people like me and like us with sarcoidosis. So I think it's finally time for us to try therapies that were designed just for people like me, like us, people with sarcoidosis. So uh, I'm quite excited uh, to hear more for, from Dr. Shukla today uh, about uh, therapies that were designed for people just like us. So uh, John, I'll toss it back to you so we can uh, hear more of these exciting news. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, everybody. So now we know uh, to whom we are listening as we go through our, our seminar here today. And yeah, you know, it's just so amazing. So many people who have come on the podcast talk about every time they try to taper off of steroids, they they wind up with another flare, <clears throat> and that's and it's and they want to get off prednisone so badly because of the side effects, and yet they every time they do something goes sideways for them. So now, since investigational therapies are, are really very new, as we've discussed so far to the sarcoidosis community and, and honestly, um, you know, uh, to the world in terms of what we're talking about right here, right now, today, uh, what information do we want to bring to the forefront of this conversation? So I want to start with the question of what do patients want and need to know about alternatives to steroids? Because they just don't want their life going sideways, but they want to have that something that's effective instead of the steroids. And Mary, let's let's start with you. Well, thank you, John. It's really an important question. Uh, and it follows the conversation that we've had uh, with the FSR community and from the community survey results um, that, that we've seen. So I, I want to share a little bit more about the survey uh, results in that specific area. So we found that 52% of patients had switched off steroids who completed the survey. And 51% reported that their healthcare providers have brought up non-steroid-based treatment with them. However, the other part of this is 80% said that they had questions about what to ask their doctor about alternatives to steroids. So it seems uh, that our patients are not sure what they need to be discussing with their doctors and what questions they should be asking. Uh, so I see real opportunity to empower patients with information and awareness through discussions like the one we're having here today. Um, it's just really important that healthcare providers also are informed about research and that the discussions between the providers and patients is candid and informative. Um, we really want patients to know what to ask um, their own healthcare providers, what considerations apply to their own health, uh, we also want healthcare providers to understand the unique concerns of their patients and be able to respond uh, with up-to-date and accurate information. So providers who treat patients with sarcoidosis have a responsibility, right, to stay current on research and investigational treatments. Uh, the sarcoidosis community, as we all know, has been misunderstood and poorly understood for far too long. Updates to our collective knowledge of sarcoidosis are long overdue. Uh, and the best way that I see this happening is through increased dialogue and awareness on all levels. Um, the go-to treatment option uh, for really for far too long, as we all know, has been steroids. And some patients have access to off-label medications, but insurance doesn't always cover them. And the off-label uh, label, uh, medications uh, have mixed success. So if sarcoidosis-specific treatments are developed and tested by the community, healthcare providers will be able to better treat their patients' unique sarcoidosis symptoms. 
And sarcoidosis disease is unique to each body, as we know. A specific way that sarcoidosis affects individuals is just that, it's individual. And that's why we nicknamed sarcoidosis as the snowflake disease. Uh, I see good reason and a real need for development of many new therapies, in part because the sarcoidosis community experiences unique symptoms and unique combinations of symptoms. Um, our survey respondent reported like one of them reported like feeling like a guinea pig because their doctor just kept trying one off-label treatment after another with no success. And we can and must do better than this. Um, only 28% of survey respondents reported feeling confident that they understood alternative treatments to steroids. If the community has low confidence in their understanding, they're going to be less likely to try alternative treatments, and they're going to be less likely to participate in a clinical trial. And as a result, the opportunity to advance the scientific understanding of the disease and treatment will not open. And again, we can't let that happen. Uh, also, half of the survey respondents said they experienced a flare when they transitioned or reduced steroid treatment. So patients have real concerns about how switching medications will affect them, like Jim was talking about. Uh, they're going to want to understand what to expect, what to look out for if they're going to reduce steroids and try something new. Patients are going to want to have confidence that they will be monitored and really taken care of during the transition time. They may also want some confidence that the tr transition will uh, will be worth it for them. So we're very excited about, uh, and, and Dr. Shukala, this is just extraordinary, uh, phase three trial. We're, we're so excited uh, on behalf of the whole sarcoidosis community for your leadership, for your team's incredible work in this area. We're so excited about this. Uh, and we do want to be able to, you know, uh, provide confidence uh, to the sarcoidosis community as we continue uh, looking at opportunities uh, for taking uh, patients off of steroids. Thank you. I'll turn it back to you, uh, John. Great. Thank you, Mary. And uh, the and the survey is is just spot on in terms of what I've heard anecdotally from the, the from the folks that I've had on the podcast. Um, and and one of them is Jim. Uh, he's been on the podcast a couple of times. So Jim, let's hear the patient perspective on this now. John and Mary, you're, you're absolutely right. I've tried steroids and just about every off-label medication available, um, and none have fully helped relieve my symptoms. Uh, just to explain, off-label uh, means that you're using a medication uh, for a purpose which really wasn't it uh, originally intended or approved. Uh, and what I mean by approved is approved by the FDA. For example, I've been prescribed several medications that have been approved by the FDA for rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and uh, for example, uh, Remicade or Humira, uh, and they've been known to help some sarcoidosis patients. Sometimes they work and uh, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they work for a little bit and they stop. Uh, and then you have to try another. As Mary mentioned, sarcoidosis, each sarcoidosis patient is different and, uh, and uh, each patient reacts differently to each off-label drug. And then you have to just keep trying and uh, you get on this merry-go-round and uh, you go up and down and just keep trying. And it's very, <clears throat> very wearisome. That's the problem with uh, therapies that were designed for someone else in with a for a different disease. They don't always work for people like me, people with sarcoidosis. Uh, I knew it was time to transition from steroids and that I needed to try something different because of the terrible side effects that I was experiencing from steroids, insomnia, mood changes, weight gain, and migraines that continue even today. Uh, that was uh, nine years ago, and uh, I still have migraines today, nine years worth of migraines because of steroids. Uh, at that time, fortunately, my doctor understood and agreed, and we laid out a plan to taper off of steroids, and uh, I began my first non-steroid medication, methotrexate, 
that wasn't great, but at least it wasn't steroids. Personally, I've been through eight different off-label therapies in my 10 years as a sarcoidosis patient, plus other medications, uh, all with varying degrees of success and failure. Recently, my rheumatologist, who's my most trusted healthcare provider, you have to have at least one of those as an anchor on your healthcare team. She alerted me to a new gene study that can tell you if a TNF blocker type of medication will work on you. Uh, well, I happen to be using a TN an off-label TNF blocker right now. So I took this moderately expensive test, uh, which my rheumatologist also helped me cover the cost. Uh, she's great. And, uh, and it came back that these type of therapies would be 90% ineffective on my type of body, my type of disease. Uh, I got the test results back and I was crushed. So much time and effort in getting it approved. Mary uh, talked briefly about that, that we have to fight the insurance company to, to get it approved because it's not a type of therapy that is made for us, not approved for us. So I spent all this time in getting it approved and jumping through hoops and now it's not effective for me, which uh, I spent all that time. I spent all that money. Uh, I went through all that pain, and now it's back to square one. So uh, like many other sarcoidosis patients, I initially looked forward to the opportunity to try something other than steroids because what the side effects were going to my body and my life uh, as a steroid patient we're not alone in uh in the side effects that um that we have it affects all those around us too i was shocked to find out at that time that there was not anything officially approved for sarcoidosis then i had a fight for something that may or may not work because the drugs were de designed for people with a different disease that's why i'm so hopeful uh to hear about all the new trials and therapies designed just for sarcoidosis patients. We need FDA approved medications that are target, targeted specifically uh, for sarcoidosis, not for arthritis or Parkinson's or cancer or any other disease. Uh, those are definitely worthwhile diseases and they need their own therapies, but we're our own disease and we need our own treatment. Don't get me wrong, moving off of steroids is a double-edged sword. John mentioned that earlier. They are painful and nasty, and steroids are, are, are definitely bad, but they work. And starting a new treatment you don't know, uh, you don't know about could be scary, and you don't know if it'll work. Uh, these all make steroids, stopping steroids harder. Plus, uh, Transitioning off of steroids is not an easy process. Excuse me. You, you can't do it in just a day and the next day decide to start another drug. It requires a step-down process and you need to have time to allow your body to slowly adjust and moderate. I have seen and heard from other sarcoidosis patients that They've got incorrect uh, instructions to just stop high dose steroids right away, cold turkey, and it always causes problems. So, uh, my last word and advice is if you get this kind of mm -hmm. instructions, go get a second opinion. Back to you, John. Thank you, Jim. Get a second opinion and, and get it fast because, yeah, get it before <laughs> you implement that. <laughs> That's for sure. And and I just I noticed you said you've taken eight different off label therapies in ten years, Jim, and that is uh, that is sad. It, unfortunately, it's true for, for many folks. Um, everything we take is off label. I'm also taking Humira right now. For and for me, it's working. Uh, thank God. But it's still off label, and I still have battles every year with the insurance company. They want to get it renewed, and then they deny, 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 and then at the last minute, um, so far, they've said yes. 
Um, so that is a, that's a common refrain. Uh, I've heard it from folks on the podcast and, and what you're saying is totally true. So let's build off the concerns that, that Jim has just uh, talked about and the results that Mary has talked about. I think they're, they're very much uh, in agreement with one another. Uh, many of the things that, that Jim has said uh, are true for the sarcoidosis community at large, not just Jim. So let's go to Dr. Shukla now and hear a little bit more about this off-label therapy, uh, how do researchers approach this, and and what do patients need to know about the research, and, and Dr. Shukla, the trial, the phase three trial that you mentioned that you have going on right now. Yeah, thanks, John, and, and great comments, uh, Jim. You know, off-label presents another challenge to patients that they don't need to deal with, and it's one of the things that we thought about early at ATIRE when we started this journey. Sarcoidosis requires, deserves, uh, demands its own approved therapy. So we don't have to have these additional barriers beyond the disease and beyond what steroids do to battle insurance companies. I mean, that's a, that's a, a that story just really uh, burns me up to kind of hear that. And as an industry individual and a researcher, this is how we approached and thought about our therapy early on. Going back seven years, we started thinking we need to do better and we need to do uh, really target a therapy that directly addresses and hopefully disease modifies, that's an important term, uh, disease modifies sarcoidosis because there's a lot of therapies out there that can maybe be add-on therapies, but why add on to a toxic therapy like steroids? So early on, uh, Efsofitamod uh, started doing some interesting things. We, we noticed some things that it did with lung cells uh, in, in um, basically in the Petri dish. It seemed to downregulate lung cells, immune cells. And these are the same cells that um, kind of are, are uh, going haywire you know, in the lungs. So that was an initial clue. Our therapy also comes from our natural physiology um, it's a, a real kind of innovative protein that exists in our all of our bodies, and we're essentially trying to supercharge it a little bit. Uh, that is important to me as a drug developer because any therapy that does good things for patients must be safe. So I think there's some natural, uh, what I call evolutionary intelligence that goes into our science. I won't go into that too much today, but what I will say is we progressed from those early research studies. We started testing in animals, in animals that had quite a bit of <clears throat> lung inflammation. Uh, the therapy seemed to do a great job of, of basically quiescing that. Uh, and then we moved into phase one trials. Phase one trials are healthy volunteer trials. This requires us to administer the therapy to make sure in individuals who are healthy, we don't see any new untoward effects, no safety findings. It's always important to me that any new therapy must be safer than the existing therapies. It's got to do good things, but why also add an additional burden to patients? Uh, that was conducted several years ago. We checked that box. We moved into phase two. Now, phase two was this attempt, um, and I think we did something really innovative. We said, we want to try to try this therapy, but we also want to try to taper people off steroids. And Jim highlighted this. This can't be done overnight. So this was, I would say, a uh, paradigm shifting trial, the, the, our design. Uh, Dr. Culver in Cleveland Clinic has said that. He said, this changes the paradigm. No longer will any trial not have some sort of steroid sparing element. That's his opinion, my opinion too. And um, any trial that comes along should incorporate that. Uh, in that trial, what did I expect to see? I expected our drug would help patients with their lung inflammation, and by removing some of that steroid slowly, I thought we might be able to also show that their quality of life improved. As it turns out in that small trial, uh, 37 patients, we saw in fact, um, the ability to improve lung function. That's great. Everybody wants to see force vital capacity get better. But if I was back in Georgia Avenue in DC treating patients, um, I can't just say, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, your FPC is getting better with this drug. It has to be more than that. The quality of life has to be better. And I was thrilled to see that in our trial, cough, fatigue, shortness of breath, they all improved. And not just moderately, 
significantly improved. The last thing I'll say, we did all this while removing and reducing steroids. And surprisingly, we even had three patients out of nine in our highest dose group get off steroids completely in our trial. So all really, really you know, outstanding findings. And we published this along with folks like Dr. Ariel uh, recently in a major medical journal. And that's also an accomplishment. There hasn't been a major medical uh, trial uh, data set in a medical journal for, I don't know, maybe 15 years. <laughs> so uh, this sets us up now. Um, the last thing I'll say in that last trial, again, it was safe. We didn't see any new effects. We don't want to see any of that. So now we've moved into phase three and we work closely with the FDA to sit down with them. This is what's required. And it's frustrating because it can take seven, eight, 10 years. But moving through systematically, this is why maybe some companies and bigger companies don't want to go into sarcoidosis. When I worked at those bigger companies, it was uh, sarcoidosis too hard, too hard of a disease, too hard of a disease to understand. Um, I guess I'm, I'm naive in the sense that that challenge was something that I thought, well, if this therapy might have some efficacy here, let's go for it. Uh, because I think we could significantly impact patients. Our therapy is designed to be disease modifying and uh, experts have said it's the first therapy that checks all three boxes, improves lung function, improves quality of life while reducing steroids. That's what I wanted to see. I think that's what any patient would want to see uh, if, if a new therapy was offered. Um, why, why, why did we go into pulmonary sarcoidosis? I get asked that question. Um, it is the most predominant form of sarcoidosis. But again, our therapy is really targeted to the lung. That's not to say it couldn't help patients who have other symptoms, cardiac symptoms, neurosarc symptoms. However, when you design a trial, you can go one or two ways. You can go after perhaps the most serious patients. And this happens quite a bit in cancer and oncology, people who have failed everything else. And certainly folks who become progressively fibrotic in sarcoidosis. Uh, and unfortunately, some of them have to go see Dr. Ariel. That could have been an area that we focused on. I thought our drug works better early on in the disease. Let's prevent that lung transplant. That's the way I thought about it. The second thing about it is pulmonary sarcoidosis, the most predominant form. If we can address that, perhaps then we can chip away into some of these other uh, subtypes. Uh, so it's a question I get asked quite a bit. Um, the goal here is to address the primary pulmonary sarcoidosis symptoms. Um, if this therapy is approved, um, at that point, we can um, have the, the, the ability to start to look at you know, smaller subsets of patients. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited um, about our trial. As I said, it's a landmark trial. We've gotten to uh, this last phase three step. Whatever happens, we're going to have a tremendous data set that's going to help experts like Dr. Ariel, even if the therapy doesn't work, learn. And I'll point this out too, that I've been involved in trials and certain diseases that the drug worked, but in other times it didn't, but it led to approved therapies. And this is why there's a call to action here to get involved here. Um, last thing I'll yeah. say is that cascade effect about other trials. Uh, I would encourage all patients to participate in trials that you're eligible for. Uh, but I will actually highlight here that um, this is a maybe once in a generation opportunity in phase three. Uh, so this is something that, you know, I'm engaged with not only FDA, but worldwide regulators in Japan, in England, in Germany. Uh, and I think the interest is what I can say from regulators. They believe we're, there should be a therapy for sarcoidosis and approved therapy. Uh, and I'm thrilled that we're part of that journey and, uh, frankly, I think we're we're kind of leading some of that. So um, that's just some of my comments. I think Dr. Ariel might want to say something. Yeah, I did. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shukla. I think that's great. And and I do want to pivot to Dr. Ariel. Um, but let me just say that uh, that Jim and I and all the other sarcoidosis patients who are on this call are pulling for you to be successful with this phase three trial. And we are really hoping that that. Uh, it gets approved and that it's something that, that uh, folks can start taking um, <clears throat> as a first line of defense against sarcoidosis sooner rather than later. Dr. Ariel, it's got to be frustrating for you because 
somebody walks in and and after fits and starts, they discover, okay, it's sarcoidosis. And now you've got to look at your limited options in treating them, right? Absolutely, John. <clears throat> so um, that's exactly the situation I'm in. You know, uh, general pulmonologists and regular, um, you know, primary care physicians refer patients over to us with, you know, uh, enlarged lymph nodes in the chest. And, you know, there's a concern for cancer and we do a bronchoscopy and, you know, we're really happy to say you don't have cancer, but now you got something called sarcoidosis. And, and you know, this is something that does not really have a, a, an approved um you know, uh, therapy, steroids work, uh, like, you know, Jim said uh, about his experience, but it's really frustrating as, as you alluded to, John, you know, dealing with insurances for off-label therapies. So as a, as a provider, it's really, really frustrating for us to have a very limited toolbox in treating diseases like sarcoidosis. Um, you know, it's like the analogy of, you know, you need to um, uh, put a screw in the wall and, you know, you don't have a screwdriver, but you have a butter knife or a credit card to kind of put it in the wall. And, you know, you can, you can imagine how frustrating it is. So we're really looking for that screwdriver or, a dr you know, drill bit to, to, to help, help with that. And I'm really hoping, you know, uh, the current trial is, is going to be um, a successful in providing something that's specific to treat sarcoidosis so we improve the quality of life. We're able to use the drug without, you know, any hassles of insurance and actually modify the disease. You know, as I mentioned earlier, too many a time I see patients where a disease has progressed while on these different, you know, you know, trial therapies with, with um, you know, off-label therapies like methotrexate or mycophenolate, imiran, going all the way to infliximab and, and uh, Humira. Um, you know, patients have uh, suffer from a lot of side effects and continue to progress. And we unfortunately have to go through to, to the process of lung trans transplantation. So, um, you know, really, I'm, I'm really hoping um, that this is going to be the tool um, that we can uh, have uh, in our uh, in our arsenal to to help um, our patients. Um, there are also, as as many of you kind of pointed out, um, problems prescribing off label medications that I just mentioned, and you know insurance dealing with insurance for you and for us is equally uh, challenging. Uh, you know, go through we got to go through several hoops. Call it, you know, spending that time while you're busy seeing patients in clinic, like, and then trying to get hold of the insurance company and trying to do a peer to peer gets rejected. You got to go back again. And it's, it's really, really, really frustrating. And then, it, you know, you get, it gets approved for a very short period of time. You got to do this over again. So that, that becomes really, really challenging. So I think if you have something that's specific to sarcoidosis like this, then we should be able to, um, you know, um, help our patients better. Um, and and uh, hopefully there won't be any hassles with insurance and access to treatment. Um, you know, the information that I also try to share with my patients so that they understand I'm prescribing specific treatments includes some terminology. It's important to understand the difference between, you know, approved therapies, off-label treatment, inve investigational therapy uh, versus a new therapy or alternative treatments. These all these terms all mean specific things, and and you know many a time they're they're used uh, incorrectly and uh, in in interchangeably. So I think that's important to understand that as well. And and the final uh, uh, thing that I want to I want to uh, uh, say say to the panel and and, the, and my patients and all the listeners is I think while there is a lot of hesitation with clinical trials. Uh, nowadays, clinical trials are very well, um, you know, guarded for, you know, problems. You know, there is a data safety monitoring board that is, uh, you know, monitoring these the data independently. And if there is uh, any signal of harm, you know, the trial gets stopped early. 
Um, now on the other hand, you know, if, if the drug does work or they, if the compound does work, you have the benefit of being on it for at least a year or two beforehand before it actually becomes mainstream. And we saw this in the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and other, you know, fibrotic lung disease back in 2012, 2013, when we were participating in the trials of, of uh, now approved therapies of nintendinib and, and perfenidone, patients who were actually on, on the trial from our uh, institution, they got to be on the drug for for well ahead of two or three years before the drug became available. And when you look at something like IPF, it means a lot. Uh, and, uh, and I think you derive the benefit of the trials uh, in, in such a way. We actually, uh, as Dr. Shukla uh, you know, pointed out, uh, participated in phase two trial. And uh, we were very, very excited with the results and really excited about phase three results. So I think I would urge all of you uh, to uh, look at the possibility of enrolling in, in uh, or at least inquiring about uh, this trial and other trials that are currently looking uh, as um, for, you know, improving uh, your, your quality of life and, and treating sarcoidosis. Um, back to you, John. Well, thank you so much, doctor. Uh, it's it's got to be frustrating for you when you want to go put that screw in the wall and you don't have the screwdriver, you just have the butter knife, or as you said, a, a, you know, the corner of a credit card, and you're trying to get it done the best way you can, but you just don't have the right tool for it. So we're getting closer and closer to inventing the screwdriver here, uh, if I can continue with that analogy, uh, with the with this phase three trial. Uh, so right now, I want to go to Dr. Shukla and Mary to look at this new therapy. And and Dr. Shukla, how close are we? What should patients know? Uh, why is it so important to participate in these clinical trials? And, and just tell us what's next on the horizon. Well, as I've mentioned and has been discussed, you know, having a targeted therapy, an approved therapy for the disease um, can impact really, you know, thousands of patients, and it can be very specific to those patients. Um, you know, folks, folks talk about, you know, they're rooting for us. Once you kind of get into phase three, it's interesting. Much of the success is in the hands of the patients themselves. And I'll, I'll reference um, a disease, cystic fibrosis. And we know it well here in San Diego because the company that essentially um, created the disease modifying therapy for that vertex right down the street. And we even have a few folks who, uh, who work there. That drug would not be available for those patients worldwide if it wasn't for the patients and the job they did in getting involved in the clinical trial. So success is tied to the patients, especially when you get into phase three. As a drug researcher, I look at things and I say, once you kind of get to phase three, you've got at least a 50-50 shot. That's, that's generally the, uh, the ratio here. And yes, you may find something new um, from a safety perspective. You don't want that to happen. Dr. Ariel pointed out there are a lot of safeguards to prevent that. We always want to keep our patients safe. But then you want to design a bigger trial, a statistically significant trial. Um, and when you think about cystic fibrosis, they did that but that wouldn't have happened in that rare disease if those patients didn't actually uh, participate in that in that um, in that trial. Um, disease modifying is important here to us. I think the way we've designed Efsofitamod is as a therapy that over the course of once a month, this is an IV infusion. Uh, it's meant to actually reduce or replace or even maybe spare you from steroids. But our trial is designed, uh, it's a one-year trial. It's designed that the drug is administered through a one-hour IV infusion. And folks have said, you know, I don't like needles, things like that. Uh, I get it. I get it. It can be a burden. Um, hopefully in the future, if the drug is approved, we have ways to reformulate uh, and, and, and get the drug delivered in a, in a less sort of cumbersome manner. But for this trial, it's a one-hour IV infusion. The drug is administered once a month. We're following 264 patients for a year. So there's essentially you know, 12, 13 visits there. Uh, this is a drug that modulates some of those immune cells uh, that we noticed in granulomas, uh, as I said, are kind of haywire, going haywire. These are uh, myeloid cells. Uh, and really excited that 
the mechanism, we really start to understand how it's really pertinent and relevant to sarcoidosis. Uh, and I'm thrilled in a couple months, we're going to be at American Thoracic Society in, uh, in DC, and we're presenting some of our mechanism of the drug uh, to, to really get the, the experts understanding. And we, we are going to be, you know, in a big symposia talk there. So it also speaks to the medical community really digging in and wanting to understand how the drug works. Um, the drug incorporates a steroid taper over the first three months. But as Dr. Ariel said, we want to keep people safe and we want to do that slowly and carefully. Um, one other thing I'll, I'll point out that the question was asked recently by a patient, what if I get put on placebo? You know, placebo, interestingly, is a necessary uh, part of showing your drug actually does something. And I'll venture to say that the patients that we don't know what you're on, whether you're on treatment or placebo, but in many ways, the placebo patients are perhaps the most important in the trial. You're serving a purpose and the 80 to 88 patients that are in our trial that will get placebo, again, you are establishing a baseline of understanding the disease and we will keep you safe, but that could show then that difference. And that's what disease modifying means. You know, to, to have a patient that basically does not get the drug, to essentially say, if you get the treatment, are you really seeing a difference in lung function? Are you really seeing a difference in cough and shortness of breath? Are you really seeing a difference in the ability to really reduce and maintain steroids? So these are some of the objectives of our phase three trial. It's being conducted in, as I said, 10 countries, uh, about 80 centers around the world. Um, we have an opportunity here to be a frontline therapy. It's going to require the patients now joining us as part of this journey. And I'm really grateful for the patients that have already joined our trial um, and, and really looking forward to in a few years, but because it, it is a one year trial, uh, hopefully in the 2025 timeframe, uh, maybe have an approved therapy. You know, John, we talked years ago and I said it could take seven, eight, 10 years. You know, yep. this was maybe in 2018. But if you think about it, we, you know, I can, you know, I can almost see that, you know, we swum out a few years ago and I can almost see the other side now. So I'm just going to keep swimming here. Uh, and I think I'm grateful for the patients that are kind of joining me in this last part of this journey. Are you still recruiting very quickly? Or do you we, are recru we, are, we are currently recruiting uh, actively at maybe about 40 centers in the U.S. Um, and uh, certainly we can, the FSR can uh, guide, guide folks who are interested um, uh, you know, after this call. Very good. Mary, what do you think of what Dr. Shukla just said? Uh, are, are you as excited as the rest of us? I am extremely excited. First of all, Dr. Shukla was kind enough to say he's uh, grateful uh, for, for, for FSR and some of our efforts. And I want to turn it right back on you, Dr. Shukla. We are so excited about this. Uh, you and I, of course, have been talking about this for a long time, and I had the honor of being with you at FDA talking about this. But every time I hear you speak, and today is no different. I get chills uh, for the sarcoidosis community uh, when I learn more about this and your efforts and your leadership uh, and all the extraordinary work that you are doing to make this trial as successful as we're all confident that it's going to be. Not only going to impact sarcoidosis patients, but as Dr. Ariel was talking about, really expanding the toolbox for doctors to be able to provide better treatment for, uh, for sarcoidosis patients. Um, so it's just so exciting. There just hasn't been this, this spotlight uh, like we see now uh, on the sarcoidosis community um, and uh, that you know is really leaning to this shining moment. And again, a big part of this is because of your leadership and your passion uh, you know, for this effort and for all the patients who are uh, who are signing up for the trial and are very excited about this as well. So I have so much hope that we can continue to inspire partnerships between researchers and industry providers and patients, and that we really can make a difference for the entire population of people living with sarcoidosis. And as I mentioned, also for doctors. Um, I believe that we have the interest uh, from the scientific community. I believe that the FDA is starting to see the path to developing new and better treatments for rare disease are a big part of this, of course, uh, will require more flexibility and forward thinking. 
Um, and I believe that providers and advocates are working to ensure equitable access to treatments for all people living with sarcoidosis. Um, and it's very important time for the stakeholders to come together, as I've said, uh, with this common goal and keeping uh, moving this momentum forward. Um, back to the survey for a minute in our community survey, uh, respondents who said they felt confident in their understanding of steroid uh, alternative therapies reported thinking about transitioning off of steroids at a higher rate than respondents who were not confident in their understanding. Um, so empowering the, our patients with competence, as I mentioned, is really critically important as this. We want patients to know what is happening in research and with industry. Uh, we want our patients to know who you are, Dr. Shukula, and what you are working on and why. This is critically important for our patient community. Uh, the same pa patients who felt competent in their understanding of steroid alternatives reported experiencing uh, more unwanted side effects from steroids. So these patients do want to learn more. And at FSR, it's our responsibility to empower patients and provide confidence. Um, about half of our community reported that their healthcare provider brought up non-steroid-based treatments with them. This was truly eye-opening for us at FSR. The community is telling us that the discussions with their providers about non-steroid-based treatments are only being started about half the time. Uh, we encourage all healthcare providers to talk to their patients about non-steroid-based treatments uh, for sarcoidosis and again, about uh, trial opportunities. Um, and then one more thing, the respondents who reported that their healthcare providers brought up non-steroid-based treatments reported more understanding of the difference between off-label medications and sarcoidosis investigational therapies at more than twice the rate of those without those healthcare provider discussions. So from that, we might infer that healthcare providers are a meaningful source of education and awareness uh, raising for the patient population. Uh, so we continue to encourage our providers uh, who are treating uh, patients with sarcoidosis to work with FSR to empower the patients and uh, improve the knowledge and understanding for specific treatments. Um, so I hope this spotlight, and I'm confident, will continue to shine on the sarcoidosis patient population. I hope that researchers, providers, patients, caregivers, and advocates continue to share information, hope, and dialogue about uh, this really opportune time, uh, as we say at, at, at FSR, the time is now. This is the, the, the shining moment for sarcoidosis to continue to build on this momentum. Um, and uh, we hope the opportunity blossoms into uh, additional trials, uh, improved disease understanding and uh, insights, real insights into causes and genetic components uh, and uh, sarcoidosis specific treatments becoming available in the very near future. Um, so a, a very exciting times. We're really uh, so grateful uh, you know, to the entire sarcoidosis community uh, in moving the, the, the needle forward it, for sarcoidosis patients who uh, we, we just, as I said earlier, our nation must do better for this world, must do better uh, in uh, caring for, for those living with sarcoidosis. Thank you so much, Mary. And I'll tell you, you what what FSR is doing is just amazing. You're you're keeping all these balls in the air in terms of your you're fighting the fight on the uh, uh, in Washington with regulators. You're working with patients. You are our best and biggest advocate, and you're bringing everybody together so so that uh, sarcoidosis really does stand out as a disease that is deserving of consideration and research and all of that. And, and so all of, uh, all of those of us who are the uh, snowflakes, as it were, um, have uh, a path forward with our individual fight. Jim, just very quickly, I know we had scheduled about two minutes for closing statements, but we're running out of time here. We want to keep this pretty close to an hour. But Jim, just quickly, are you feeling more optimistic after everything you've heard today? Probably be better with uh, with uh, my microphone on. As I mentioned earlier, I, I am really excited by all the new trials and all the new focus uh, that's finally happening in the sarcoidosis world. 
there needs to be something better for people like uh, us living with sarcoidosis. Uh, frankly, because there is no approved and effective treatment, I'm losing valuable moments of my life each and every day. I'm not the only one that uh, lives with these experiences and the roller coaster of therapies. It's not unique to just to us sarcoidosis patients. I've spoken to so many of my other fellow chronic rare disease friends who face the same struggle every day, just like uh, you and I do, John. Yet we get up and fight. Uh, and we fight on every day in the hopes of new therapies that are just now coming about. Both Dr. Shukla and Dr. Ariel mentioned one outcome of new therapies is improved quality of life. Uh, honestly, that's really a little beyond uh, comprehension for me right now. But, uh, but if I could just get uh, a little more time back with my family, and a little bit of time with my friends, that would be amazing. I know I speak for all of us who had to miss out on a family event because we weren't feeling up to it, or we had to cancel a time with some friends because of a flare up. Uh, I, I know that happens to all of us. Just to have some semblance of a normal life back would, would be great. So in summary, uh, on behalf of all the patient community, I can say we are ready to transition off of steroids. We need to be confident of the treatment solution, but we are ready and now's the time. We really can't wait any longer. Thanks for having me here today. Thanks, Mary, for again, all you can do. Uh, Dr. Sukla, we're behind you. Uh, Anything you need from the patient side, we're ready. Back to you, John. Thank you, Jim. Dr. Shukla, uh, Jim said it so well. Uh, so, you know, how if somebody's listening right now, you want to give them hope. Let's talk about the impact of, of this drug and, you know, when you think that somebody might be able to start taking it. Well, like I said, we're in the final leg here. And, you know, I'll just keep this short in saying that we're committed at ATIRE. We've got uh, a team really heads down working hard to enroll this trial this year. Uh, it is a one-year therapy. So, of course, that last patient, when they enroll, it's a year from there. My expectation is early 2025 uh, to be able to look at the data. Uh, and, and let me just say one thing here. We didn't create the data, the patients did, and the patients will in the next trial. So this is not ATIRE's data, it's not FSR's data, it's not Fairfax and Nova's data. We all work together, but the patients created the data that demonstrated great things. I'm hoping to replicate that in a larger trial and hopefully in 2025 be able to present it to worldwide regulators um, and have a discussion uh, and have a good a good outcome. So I really appreciate everyone on this call, the FSR, you, John, Jim, uh, Dr. Ariel, the site coordinators who help us, but most importantly, those patients. Thank you. Thank you to those patients for listening uh, and or participating. Thank you, Dr. Shukla and Dr. Ariel. I know you're very excited about the opportunity to look a patient in the eye and say, guess what? We have a drug for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's been over 150 years since sarcoidosis was first described, and we're finally looking at a phase three trial. We're making history. This is a monumental moment for the whole sarcoidosis community, and I'm really looking forward to, you know, enrolling patients here and, and uh, you know, having a positive trial. So, as you said, John, looking at my patient's eyes and saying, we got something that's going to treat this. Thank, Thank you. you. And Mary, you just want to put a bow on it here and just talk about how optimistic we all are. Yes, I'll keep it short and sweet. Uh, but in summary, really, this year and next should be a real turning point for people engaged in sarcoidosis research uh, through trial participation and communication. 
between the stakeholders and research community, we can soon have a better understanding of the causes and uniqueness of the disease and uh, most likely better therapies uh, are on the horizon. And you know, just to say it, we are all unified by an extraordinary uh, list of opportunities, including uh, that the patient community will experience better care and better quality of life. And this is what FSR stands for. It's well, you know, what we are all working on every day diligently. Dr. Shukla, it's what you stand for and your extraordinary team at ATIRE and the work that's being done uh, in this third trial, uh, third phase trial uh, for sarcoidosis. Dr. Ariel, your extraordinary leadership uh, at ANOVA for joining forces with the FSR Global Sarcoidosis Clinic Alliance, who all of the clinics are working uh, together uh, in this uh, united effort. And thank you for being a, a site for the trial. And, and for John and Jim, your extraordinary uh, leadership on the patient front, sharing your stories and constantly advocating uh, for the patient community uh, for sarcoidosis, and we just appreciate all that you are doing, and for all of the people who completed the survey, uh, and for the patients who are signing up for the trial. As was mentioned earlier, you really have the power, an extraordinary power and opportunity to change the lives of people living with sarcoidosis today and well into the future, uh, and that's an extraordinary opportunity. So again, thank you to all. This was an extraordinary event. We need to be doing more of these to keep the dialogue going. Uh, and we are so very grateful for the partnership for everybody in this, this unique and uh, vibrant community. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you to Dr. Shambu Ariel, to Dr. Sanjay Shukla, and to uh, our patient representative and advocate on behalf of FSR. Jim Kuhn. I think we've had a great discussion here today, and we have a wonderful opportunity to take the next step in battling this disease. So thank you all uh, for serving on the panel. And of course, thank you to the many, many, many people, uh, hundreds of people who have signed up to watch this. And of course, it'll be available on the FSR YouTube channel and as an audio recording on the uh, Sark Fighter podcast as a bonus episode. So thank you all for joining us here today. I feel like a zombie Just feeding and stumbling So thanks to Dr. Ariel, Dr. Sanjay Shukla, FSR CEO Mary McGowan, and Sark patient and FSR advocate and navigator and friend Jim Kuhn. And again, if you're looking for answers, information, and straight talk about sarcoidosis, where else, where else will you actually get to hear the very top people in the field, the people who are plugged in, making a difference, uh, and they're all in your podcast, right, in one place at one time, talking about the issues that are important to you. And it's without the hyperbola, it's without uh, all kinds of drastic language, uh, or, or anything else that sometimes you, you listen to or you hear or you read in a forum and you think, you know, this is a person who's, who's very upset or very frustrated and, and they're throwing all kinds of emotion out there. And not that it's not emotional. Uh, I get very emotional when I listen to folks talking about this and I think about my own situation. But, um, but this is just, it's straight talk, it's interesting, it's easy to understand, it's easy to break down, and we couldn't do it if uh, basically the folks at the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research didn't have the reach and the pull that they have to get all these people together at one time. So, and I'm just very, very pleased to play a small role in, uh, in keeping the conversation going and asking the questions and, and getting all that information out there. Hey, I've got to remind you that my fellow Sark fighter, your fellow Sark fighter, Royce Robertson, is doing a fundraising bike ride, and this is no small task. It'll take him three days as he rides from Buffalo to Syracuse, New York. He's calling the event Cycle for Sark. 
If you've been listening, you know that as a cyclist, I really wanted to go with him and do this ride and maybe even record along the way. I had all kinds of things in the back of my mind, but between his schedule and mine, we just weren't able to make it so that I could join him this year, but he's he's going to do it. And so I've made a donation to his account, which is part of KISS, Kick In to Stop Sarcoidosis. All the inf- information, if you want to donate, is uh, it's in the show notes, or you just go to the FSR website, and then you'll see a drop down for Join Team KISS. And if you click on that and just scroll down a little bit, you'll see Royce's page called Cycle for Sark. You click on that and you make a donation. And since I can't be there to ride with Royce, I'm doing all I can to support him. And I'm asking you to help do the same. Make a make a donation, please. And remember, all the funding goes to FSR. And I can just foresee a time when this grows into something where Royce and I and hopefully many of you all come together and ride our bikes somewhere and raise money for sarcoidosis and do that once a year and make it a big deal. Um, but for this year, Royce has it on his shoulders. He is looking for people to go with him if you're interested, so you can contact him. His information is also in the show notes. Remember the official Sark Fighter song, Zombie, is by Mark Steyer, who plays in a band called the White Hot Lizards in Alberta. Hear his story back in episode 12. And remember, we release this podcast every other Monday as I'm speaking today. Yes, my wonderful and trusty dog, Dougal, a boxer that my wife and I rescued as a puppy from the local SPCA, is curled up on the chair in my office, and just by being here makes my life so much better. Thank you to Dougal. The backstory for the founding of the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research is all the way back in episode 11 with Andrea and Redding Wilson. Please follow the Sark Fighter podcast on Facebook and on Instagram. If you happen to have a Peloton, uh, you can follow me as Sark Fighter. And I do have a cycling blog called Carl and the Cyclist, and there's a section in there called Cycling with Sarcoidosis. And I continue to be amazed at the number of people who have been on this podcast who have been athletic in one way or another in their lifetime. And then all of a sudden, Sark shows up and things that all of us just thought we could do normally because we enjoyed it uh, or had some aptitude for it or or both, uh, sarcoidosis comes along and just knocks you back. And so whether it was me with cycling or... Uh, Mark Steyer and hockey or uh, Sam Wassel, who I just interviewed recently, uh, who is a runner. And by the way, Sam, I will tell you that Sam just sent me an email and she just completed a marathon in three hours and 35 minutes. Which, and she won the marathon on the woman's side and she was doing that during a flare So, um, but she is just pushing through and she talked about her story. Um, So anyway, for me, it's cycling with sarcoidosis. But even if you're not interested in riding a bike, what I went through, especially when I was dealing with flares and with heavy doses of various medications, prednisone, cytoxin, um, my struggle and your struggle are not that different. And you, and you may find that you find some common ground there or you can find a way to proceed from wherever you are by reading about what I was dealing with when I was cycling with sarcoidosis. And I continue to ride my bike. Uh, luckily, I'm essentially in, uh, in not remission but controlled, and so I'm, I'm riding quite a lot these days. But uh, anyway, you might want to check out the blog. That's why I mention it. If you're new here and you're just trying to figure out what sarcoidosis is, listen to episode two with Dr. Simon Hart, where we went over sarcoidosis 101. And then my sad story is episode one. I tell you how it evolved and everything that happened to me when I was diagnosed. Please send me an email if you'd like to contact me, carlinagency at gmail.com. There's a link in the show notes. I appreciate your interest in the Sark Fighter podcast. It helps me reach more people and grow the show if you share it on your social media, which people seem to be doing because the number of listens is way up. I appreciate that. And if you like it, please just tell one person. And if you would, give the show a nice review on Apple Podcasts or wherever 
you get your downloads. Until next time, keep fighting. Learn to suffer, you feel pain someday. Learn endurance, your strength will fade away. Dead man walking, trying to keep up the pace. Dead man walking, counting.